Hi guys, it's me, Chazer HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast, episode 45, I believe, of the podcast, where today we are going to be doing a preview for the rest of 2019 for the teams and drivers and how we think they're going to do and what they need to, say, get out of the final nine races. Of The final nine races, not for everyone, are, you know, critical or very, very important, but for certain teams and drivers, it is very important, as we'll get on to in this podcast today. But as always, I have my guest along with me, as always, Nib. And Nib, how are you doing, mate? And uh, are you looking forward to previewing how the teams and drivers are going to do for the final nine races? Yes, I'm doing uh, very well, mate. Thanks for asking on what is uh, Thursday morning, the 15th of August for me. So very good morning for me. Um, but yeah, I am looking forward to previewing the second half of the season. Of course, nine races remaining. Somehow we're in August, already the middle of August. Uh, it just feels like about two weeks ago that was the Australian Grand Prix, start of the season, um, and now we're at Spa. So we're still, it's it's incredible how quickly the season's gone. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for the second half to begin. Yep, absolutely. After the first uh, 12 races, you have to say the majority of them were very, very good. But let's go into the teams and let's start off with, of course, Mercedes. Now, the one big thing to look out for for this team and their drivers for the final nine races is them collecting the drivers and constructors title because they did so much hard and good work in the first 12 races to you know build a lead in the constructors and for lewis hamilton to build his respective lead in the drivers uh, championship but the biggest thing that will come out of the final nine races will be them celebrating a drivers and constructors title once again now, for the final nine races, I don't think pace-wise or results-wise it's going to be as great as the first 12 races was because definitely Red Bull have caught this team. And I think when it comes to qualifying, Ferrari are absolutely right there when they don't bottle it and actually show up for once. So they are in for a few tests before the season is finished. I think, for example, at Spa, Monza... Singapore, uh, Mexico, definitely in races like that, they're going to be under threat from Red Bull and at times Ferrari between now and the end of the season. Uh, but again, for the drivers, Lewis Hamilton, all he has to do really is finish ahead of his teammate Valtteri Bottas to win the drivers' championship as early as possible. Now, of course, Max Verstappen is right behind Bottas in P3. And for Stappen, I think will pass Bottas in the Drivers' Championship, but because of how good the Mercedes car is, Valtteri is still going to be right there with Max Verstappen at certain races. Not because Bottas is as good, it's because the car that he's driving is very, very good. So from a Lewis Hamilton point of view, all he has to do is finish head of Valtteri Bottas, really, and he will win the Drivers' Championship around Mexico, as he usually does. And for Bottas, well, when it comes to him keeping his seat at the team, it looks as though that decision will be took before we get to Spa. So, in his final nine races, he really should just go for it and see what happens, because you never know, he could get a couple race wins. He does have... You know, a couple tracks on the calendar remaining that are very good for him, such as Russia. So, I think for the drivers, they simply just have to continue getting good results. And for the team, the drivers and constructors, they're coming. They're absolutely coming. And I think this team is in for a very uh, successful end of the season, as they usually have. Nib, for this team... They're not going to be, again, as great and as dominant as they were in the first seven or eight races of the season. But even though Red Bull and Ferrari are improving here and there, they are still going to be the team to beat, aren't they? Absolutely. Now, I, I agree with you here. You'd expect them not to be as dominant in the second half of the season. But who knows? They, they could bring some sort of update that they haven't publicised. And boom, just be absolutely comfortably the quickest once again. It just could happen. But I don't think that that will happen. I still think that they'll be pretty close, um, that the field will still be pretty close to how it is right now. 
throughout the second half of the season. Of course, it depends on what tracks, you know, are coming up. We've got tracks that suits other cars better than it does the Mercedes and certain tracks which it favours the Red Bull more than, say, the Mercedes. So, yeah, obviously, as you said, Mercedes' goal is just to get the drivers and constructors wrapped up as quickly as possible and realistic. And honestly, I don't think there can be much doubt that Hamilton's going to win the title. Um, it's going to take some sort of major um, disaster for Hamilton to to lose the title from here. You know, he hasn't driven at his best so far this season, and he has doesn't exactly need to against Valtteri. We've seen Valtteri be very good in qualifying, um, but in the race, it just hasn't translated in, uh, in most of the occasions. I think we've seen perfectly at Hungary. Absolute nightmare of a first lap. And, you know, it's so important. Like, if you can't get the win, then you need to be finishing second behind your teammate uh, to make sure that you don't lose as many points as possible. And in the last six races, Bottas hasn't done that. I think he's only scored about 60-odd points, of course, Um uh, that was the retirement in there at Hockenheim, but just a bit bit pulled by Bottas in the last couple of races. And of course, with Mercedes um, trying to choose or decide, I'm not sure why they're trying to decide. I think it's quite clear that Bottas should keep his seat, um, that he's under a little bit of pressure. So he really does have to perform in the second half of that season. And I think that's my most major thing to be looking out for, um, for Mercedes, because quite honestly, I pretty much say the championship. Uh, well, I only see Hamilton winning the championship. So that's that's where I'm majorly focused for Mercedes in the second half of the season. Not too sure when the decision will be made on that, but uh, it will be an interesting one for sure. Yep, absolutely. And also, another thing to look out for is whether this team, because they have the gap they do have in both the drivers and constructors, it'll be interesting to look out and see whether they will start concentrating development-wise on 2020 because, of course, they don't want to be caught out in 2020 if Ferrari and Red Bull really do improve, especially, you know, uh, at the start of those respective uh, seasons for them. Next up, Ferrari. Now, at Spa and Monza, those two races, Ferrari, I can tell that they, they are absolutely going to go for it because... For them, a winless 2019 would be too painful for them. I know it would. Even though I don't think Ferrari are going to win in the final nine races because I don't think, you know, as a team, they can get the job done. At Spa and Monza, pace-wise, they will have a good enough car to do so. But again, I don't think they will have, um, say, enough brains to win those races or you know get results that they absolutely should from those races but after those races if they either you know do win or they fail to win then after that race their home race i don't see them really improving because if you look at the circuits they're not really ferrari tracks and also this team should be after the italian grand prix they should be concentrating on 2020 because if they don't get a win at either of those two circuits, which really should suit their car, then I don't see what there is to gain in the final seven races after the Belgian and Italian Grand Prix. So hopefully for Ferrari, from a Ferrari point of view, they can get a win at one of the uh, races at Spa and Monza, and then they can start to concentrate on 2020. But if they don't win, which I don't, I, I don't think they will win because again they'll somehow cock it up. They cannot keep chasing the win for the rest of 2019 because even if they do eventually get the win, it's not really going to mean anything. It just means that you know, congratulations, you've finally done something that you should have done at race two or race four or race seven or race nine. So, you know, them going for the win at Spa and Monza, I totally get it. I think they should go for it because considering how bad 2019 has been, they need to at least get one win to make themselves look respectable. But after that, whether, or after those two races, whether they win or not, 
They need to start concentrating on 2020 because if they're going to actually go for the championship of 2020, then they need to start actually working mostly or fully towards that pretty soon because if they don't get things right for 2020, then I think they could be in for the same season. So hopefully Ferrari can get a win, but I really don't think they can. Nib, for Ferrari, what can they do in the final nine races for you, uh, which would go down as an achievement? Um, getting through a qualifying session without, uh, <laughs> with both cars making through to Q3, because seemingly the last couple of races that that's just not been possible. But uh, of course, I'm joking. But obviously, Spa and Monza they have to they have to win at least one of those races, if not both. You know, this season is already kind of, well, not kind of, is a failure for Ferrari. They won the challenge for the title, and they're not going to be able to do so quite clearly. And if they go without a win throughout the whole entire season, then it will be an absolute disaster for Ferrari, that is for sure. And I think that something that really does need, it needs to be paid attention to is that uh, I think they're bringing an upgrade for, the, for Spa, an engine upgrade worth about 20 um, brake horsepower so that is quite a big upgrade um, and they already have quite an advantage in qualifying um, and must be said because they don't use their higher modes in the race at all so in qualifying they've already got quite a big advantage on everyone else with the engine so if they're bringing another 20 brake horsepower then that will be uh that'll be quite interesting to see and should put them in a good position to go and challenge for that win um, at Spa but I think another track where they could potentially be successful is Suzuka. Um, Ferrari are very good in the high speed corners. They're, they're better than Mercedes, um, better than better than Red Bull as well. If you look at the data throughout the whole entire season, um, and then of course from out of the hairpin all the way down to spoon, and then all, all the way out of spoon down towards one thirty R is completely flat out. So. I think that that is a bit of a sleeper that they could actually perform quite well at. Um, certainly in qualifying, of course, in the race, they will struggle because they can't keep their tyres uh, in check and they just struggle with the balance of the car once the fuel comes out of the car. Um, but, yeah, well, it's just been an awful season. And, of course, they will be already working on the 2020 car. Um, but, yeah, if they, I'm, I'm assuming that this latest upgrade will probably be the last sort of engine upgrade focused um, on this year. They'll be focusing on the engine for next year and hopefully they can sort out the reliability issues because it absolutely has been the most powerful engine all throughout the year, but they've had issues um, quite often now. They had issues, um, I don't think it was with the engine, but certainly with the gearbox in France. Of course, how can you forget Bahrain? And then the last couple of races, there's been quite a bit of mistakes with the engine and failures with the engine. So... Yeah, Ferrari need to certainly nail out some reliability there. But for the second half of the season, they absolutely just have to have to win a race. Otherwise, it's a complete and utter disaster of a season. Yeah, they would be uh, in a similar way to 2016. Now, of course, in 2016, their car wasn't at every race or most races as good as, I think, the 2019 car. But... If you look at that season, it has been a similar-ish season where they had the opportunity to do something and rarely did they take it. So I think if Ferrari, they don't win, as you said, at Spa and Monza, where they should get at least one victory, then I don't see where it comes from. But now let's go on to Red Bull, who I think will, I'm going to make this prediction because I think it will come true. I think Red Bull will uh, catch and pass Ferrari in the constructors because they're only 44 points behind Ferrari. Again, they're blowing so many points that they should be getting. And that's the reason, to be honest, Red Bull, even though Max Verstappen has been the only real driver for Red Bull in the first uh, 12 races of 2019. The reason Ferrari are only 44 points clear is because Red Bull are great at picking up the points uh, at race tracks. They don't really deserve to pick up points because Ferrari are not getting the points they should, but also the Red Bull car is all the time with Honda and their power unit is 
you know, continuously improving. For the final nine races, I think the Red Bull car and the Honda power unit together will improve. Not massively, but it will improve and they'll get even better. And, you know, winning races in 2019 will not be as difficult for Red Bull by the time we get to, you know, Mexico, Cota, Brazil and Abu Dhabi. But I think because of how great Max Verstappen has been in 2019, I think he will really help Red Bull get close to Ferrari and eventually pass them. But of course, Red Bull now have a new number two to Max Verstappen, and that is Alexander Albon, who of course replaced this man, Pierre Gasly at Red Bull, who after a, a terrible, very, very poor first 12 races at Red Bull was dropped and... He deserved to be dropped. He absolutely did. He was nowhere near the required level that you need to be at in a Red Bull car or in that you know type of car compared to the rest of the field. Also, I just want to make this one point when it comes to Gasly and uh, say sympathy for Gasly or sympathy for any drivers. In my opinion... When it comes to sympathy for teams or drivers in Formula 1, I do not have sympathy for people who are in bad situations because they put themselves in that bad situation. That is why, I think a few days ago when I did my stream about uh, the breaking news that Albon replaced Gasly, that's why I said that Pierre Gasly, for me... Um, he doesn't deserve any sympathy from me because his bad performances put him in this situation where he's now dropped back to Toro Rosso. I also feel the same way about Williams. I don't feel any sympathy for Williams because they are at the back because they have put themselves in that situation. And for me, not only in Formula One, in sport, in life, if you're in a bad situation because you put yourself there, I... I just generally don't feel sympathy for that for that person. I will say, though, I do hope that Gasly can somehow recover um, in the final nine races for Toro Rosso. We'll get onto that later on in how he'll compete and uh, against Daniel Kvyat and try and recover from being dropped. But I just want to make that point that, again, when you put yourself in a bad situation, I don't really feel sympathy in that type of situation if Gasly had had a lot of bad luck and was dropped unfairly say like Kvyat was in terms of how Kvyat made one error and then got dropped then I would feel sympathy for him but he deserved to be dropped so I don't really feel sorry for the guy but yep he's replaced and now Alexander Albon takes over his seat and hopefully for Albon he can do a better job than Gasly I think he will I think for Albon, he shouldn't set his expectations too high. I think his aim should be probably a couple podium finishes. I don't think he should be aiming to win a race because I don't think he is quite good enough for that. But a, a couple podium finishes at tracks where the Red Bull car is good, I think that's a, a good enough aim for Albon in his first nine races as a Red Bull driver but Nib of course we haven't got your thoughts as to Gasly getting replaced by Albon for the rest of the season um what is your opinion about this was Gasly deserving of being dropped how do you feel about the news or how do you think also Alexander Albon will do at Red Bull well quite honestly is there even a question that our uh, Pierre should not have been dropped I think quite obviously he deserved to be dropped from the Red Bull, uh, from the Red Bull team. You know, when you don't perform and you just get outscored by Carlos Sainz since France or Austria, like in when you're in a Red Bull, when your teammates winning and challenging races, and you can't even outscore a McLaren, Red Bull had no other option. They had to, you know, we've seen Horner and other people say, "Oh, we're going to give him to the end of." Um, to the end of the year, they ultimately couldn't because it would just, it, it'd probably end up in them finishing P3 in the constructors when if they've got another driver in there who can do that, they might get P2. And of course they chose and they went with Alexander Albon over Danny Kvyat. And it's, it's kind of a no risk because, you know, 
if Albon isn't as good um, as they expected or doesn't perform as well as they hoped, they can then just put Kvyat in there. And then people who were saying that, oh, they're not going to put Kvyat in the car because, oh, Helmut Marco doesn't like him. If Helmut Marco really did not like Danny Kvyat, he wouldn't be in the sport again. Um, and I don't think, well, they're going to have no option, you know. If if Albon doesn't perform and isn't near um, Verstappen, who else are they going to put in the car? What, they're just going to put some absolute rookie in the car or something or buy another driver out the program? I don't think they will. And they know that at the end of the day, Kvyat is a quick driver and there was literally one mistake that cost him his seat just so they could get Max in the car, which was absolutely the right decision. But, of course, very unlucky for um, for Kvyat at the time. But, yeah, um, I think the album will probably do a better job than Gasly, although he has made quite a few mistakes so far this season. Has Albon still getting used to the world of F1 uh, and to the F1 cars? I, I think he will do better than Gasly, but he could um, he could make a few more mistakes than Gasly. And Gasly's already made a couple of mistakes, of course, um, only at the German Grand Prix when he absolutely totaled the car in on the Friday practice. Um, yeah, but I think... Obviously, Max is still going to be faster than Albon, but if Albon, all he needs to do is that he needs to finish, well, at at least in sixth place. That is absolutely the minimum that has to be expected from Alexander Albon at pretty much every single race, unless there's absolute chaos at some race or there's rain or there's safety cars. He has to finish P6, and if he doesn't finish P6, then it's going to be quite obvious that he's not going to keep his seat. Um, in that Red Bull for the for 2020. Of course, we'll get it, move on to that towards the end of the season. But moving on, of course, to Max Verstappen. Well, you can only really still see him challenging for race wins um, or for the rest of the season. And I think at Spa, I think Red Bull really uh, will be underrated because through that middle sector, they will be very quick. They're always fantastic at the middle sector at Spa. And now that they have a better engine, I think it's I think it's I think it's comfortable to say that they have a better engine uh, than they did this time last year. So I think that they could do pretty well at, at Spa. Maybe not so at Monza, but I expect Red Bull to certainly win a couple of races um, for the remainder of the season with Max Verstappen. And yeah, I I, I as you said as well, I do expect him to finish P two in the constructors. Yeah, I think. I think Red Bull, as long as they can keep improving the car, Max can keep up his performances and Albon can do better than Gasly, they really should get second in the constructors as long as Ferrari maintain their usual form of bottling it and not getting the results they should. So I think things going forward for Red Bull definitely looking uh, very, very good. But now... Let's get into the midfield, and we're going to cover Renault and McLaren uh, in the same uh, portion of this podcast. So let's first talk about Renault for the rest of the season. As long as they can end the season as uh, or end the season better than they started it, I think that'd be a a good end considering how the season has gone. I don't really believe it can get any worse surely it can't get any worse than what it was in Hungary where they really did not have the pace at all to finish in the points so as long as they finish off the season again in a better way than they started it which was not finishing in the points enough not good enough aerodynamically and you know the reliability being poor then I think they can probably be top five in the constructors but if you look at the current situation in the Constructors' Championship, it's quite embarrassing for Renault. They are 40 to 50 points behind a McLaren team that was awful last season. They're behind Toro Rosso in the Constructors, which is unacceptable. Yes, I know Toro Rosso, you know, a lot of their points were from Hockenheim, but it's not like Toro Rosso did not deserve to finish where they did. They did, Toro Rosso. They deserve to finish in P3 and P6 in that Grand Prix. So I think Toro Rosso do deserve to be ahead of Renault. And if you look at the constructors, 
positions behind Renault. Renault are currently, I believe, in P6. You've got Alpha behind them. Alpha have been better than Renault since Renault's home Grand Prix. So as long as Kimi Raikkonen can continue to do what he's been doing in that car and the Alpha can maintain its level, I think Alpha will beat Renault for sure, even if Toro Rosso do drop off, which I think will probably happen. Racing Point have improved. And Haas, I think Haas are probably not going to get near Renault because they're going to probably focus more so development-wise on 2020 because they don't want to suffer the same issues for next season as well. So I think they'll beat Haas. But if you look at the constructors, they could theoretically finish in P8 in the constructors' championship. This is not Toro Rosso. This is not Racing Point. This is the Renault Formula 1 team. And they could honestly finish in P8 in the constructors. Because form-wise, I think if the form you know continues, they could end up being beaten by Alpha and Racing Point. which simply cannot happen it cannot happen for this team they've got two very good drivers they've got good personnel they pumped a lot of money into this project but it's not working at all so they've got to have a good final nine races of the season because if they don't then yeah they are gonna drop no doubt about that and for mclaren i think this team already has p4 on the constructors secured so as long as they continue finishing the points consistently i think that's good enough for them in the final nine races if there's a crazy grand prix in the final nine races maybe they could maybe get a podium or a top four finish we'll see but yeah mclaren you know they'll be there consistently top seven or eight but renault they really do need a good end to the season because if they if they drop if they drop behind Racing Point and Alpha, this season will probably kill this entire project because, you know, dropping from P4 in the Constructors from 2018 to a possible P7 or P8 would be absolutely horrible for Renault. Absolutely horrible. Nib, for these two, uh, what do you see for them going forward for the rest of 2019? And for Renault, more importantly, do you think... They can actually end the season well, or do you think they'll just drop behind, say, Alpha or maybe even Racing Point? Well, uh, let's start off on the less depressing note. Uh, we'll go to McLaren first. Um, <laughs> you know, I I only see them continuing how they've performed in the first half of the season. You know, it's obviously just got better and better. Of course, at the start of the season, uh, they weren't tremendous, but they really have done a fantastic job having McLaren to quite clearly cement themselves at the top of the midfield. Um, both drivers have been driving superbly, in particular Carlos Sainz. He's been absolutely fantastic this season. And, you know, when you're outscoring a Red Bull over, over a number of races, uh, I think that says a lot. Um, even though perhaps the driver in the Red Bull wasn't doing so well, still to be doing it is a fantastic achievement. So well done to Carlos Sainz on that. And at the moment, he currently is absolutely the best driver um, in the midfield. So, yeah, I only see McLaren keeping P4 in the constructors, continuing to beat the top of the midfield most weekends. Who knows, there could be a couple of weekends which are when they are not at the top of the top of the midfield. But that, that just happens in the midfield. You might just have a bit of a poor track. We've seen that before. And it certainly won't be the last team to suffer that fate. But... Moving on to Renault now. Oh, very, uh, yeah, as a Daniel Ricciardo fan, obviously myself being Australian, I support Mr. Ricciardo. Uh, this has not been a nice season. Since Canada, it, it really has gone downhill. Uh, um, there, was a, there was a good four or five race period where always making into Q into Q3, you know, then scoring points in the races, but that has just fallen away. Struggling to make in the Q3 now. Um, really struggling, and then struggling to get points in the races as their car in the race um, isn't very good. And the main issue is with the car. Um, it, the rear, the front to rear is just not connected, so it's very difficult to drive. There's there's um, disagreement on which way the car should go in terms of upgrading it. Um, 
They they should have had upgrades early in the season before the French Grand Prix, but they came at France because of miscommunication within the team. Um, then those upgrades did not work and have put them back even further. So it, it really, since the French Grand Prix, in all honesty, it's been extremely disappointing for Renault. Um, you know, they could have had a good points finish at, at Hockenheim, but, um, you know, Hulkenberg went and put it in the wall at the drag strip. Uh, at the final corner, you know, just a missed opportunity there, but it wouldn't have been reflective of how they've performed really since France. You know, they really have been poor and they need to step it up. And honestly, I don't think they will step it up. I think Renault will continue to lag behind the, the midfield. Um, well, not behind the midfield, behind the top of the midfield. So behind, uh, behind McLaren, behind Haas, maybe. Who knows, Haas, a bit, Haas might have a couple of good tracks. Um, maybe not behind Racing Point, but certainly behind Alpha and perhaps Toro Rosso. So, yeah, it's it's quite concerning for them, and especially when they spent the amount of money that they have on, on everyone else, well, on Ricardo and such. It's very disappointing, and um, the investors at Renault will certainly be looking at this project and thinking, hmm... Is this all worth it? And Cyril Beatball, his job certainly is under threat. So it's certainly going to be a big second half of the season for the Renault F1 team. Absolutely. And, uh, well, if they don't turn it around in a in a satisfactory enough way, then I think Cyril will probably uh, bite the bullet at the end of the season because I don't think the top, uh, top brass at Renault are going to accept Renault finishing say sixth or lower i i just i i don't see how renault are going to accept that but now let's move on to the rest of the midfield teams first off out Al uh, alfa romeo first half of the season was mostly good a couple races were a bit iffy but most of it was good with kimi Räikkönen at the wheel of course and as long as they maintain the level they have for the final few races before the summer break as long as they maintain that level for the rest of 2019 then Alpha theoretically should finish P5 in the Constructors because I think Toro Rosso will drop because I don't think Toro Rosso will be able to develop like Alpha and Renault. And I think Alpha do have a quicker car. It's just Toro Rosso, whenever they get an opportunity of a point, they take it basically every time. So as long as Alpha and continue with the car they have had, I think they'll be absolutely fine. The thing that needs work on is Antonio Giovinazzi, because even though he has improved as 2019 has gone on, he is still costing the team points in terms of him not being up there with his teammate at races where he should. For example, I know Francie did get kind of unlucky with the whole tyres thing, but... He definitely could have looked after his tyres better. And I think that's definitely something he does have to work on. Because he also struggled at Silverstone, I think, with looking after the tyres. Um, Hungary for him was awful when his teammate Kimi Raikkonen was up in uh, P7. So, I think if Antonio can have more races like he had at Austria and Hockenheim, then I think Alpha will absolutely beat Renault in the constructors but if Antonio still is inconsistent and not there and Alpha having to rely on Kimi then it will be tougher for sure I still think Alpha will beat Renault in the constructors even if Antonio stays inconsistent and Kimi keeps up his performance but it would definitely help uh, Alpha Romeo I'm sure if Antonio could provide more races like he had in Austria on a more say regular basis if you look at the tracks coming up there are a couple circuits where I think Antonio with the type of car he does have he should be competitive in the top 10 for sure uh for Alpha Nib do you think P5 in the constructors is a realistic target I do think that P5 is a realistic target of course um they could win that appeal um, with them being or getting that 30 second time penalty for both cars at Germany they could win that appeal so they could get some more points there 
But ultimately, I think it is a very realistic goal. They've been, they've been, they haven't been fantastic. I'd say this season there hasn't been really a, a one race where you think, "Wow, you know, look at Alpha," but they've been con- they've been just picking up points when they need to, and they're in P five in the constructors. So I don't think you can argue against them being there, and I don't think you can say that they're not that they couldn't think or that they couldn't finish in P5 in the Constructors. They absolutely can, that's for sure. And it's going to be it's going to be a bit of a more tougher second half of the season, I think, for Alpha. Um, but I think with, with Alpha, it has been very tough to predict where they're strong. Um, whereas last year, we kind of, you know, knew where some certain midfield teams would be good. Whereas this year, uh, it's very tough to see because it's so yo-yo. It, it depends a lot on the tyres. And as you mentioned, Kimmy is Kimmy. Kimmy is going to be great for the rest of the season. We just know what you're going to get from Kimmy. But Giovinazzi, I think he has had a pretty solid um, first season in Formula One. But yeah, obviously not as good as um, well what you'd you'd be hoping for. It could be could be better, of course. And that's certainly what um, Mr. Giovinazzi needs to work on is his consistency. And if he can work on that and get better results in the race, then I really don't see how Alpha wouldn't finish P5 in the Constructors. Yeah, I think definitely um, Alpha, when it comes to the races and the Constructors battle, they are absolutely a team to look out for, no doubt about it whatsoever. Now, we come on to Haas. Now, we're not going to be taking too long talk about Haas because I don't actually think the rest of 2019 is going to be that noteworthy for Haas because I get the feeling with this team that they're quietly preparing for 2020 because I think they've had you know, so many issues with their car so far this season that it's probably best to start working on you know what they could improve or uh, improve upon for 2020 so i think for haas going forward for the final nine races i think what you'll see is them testing things out try and see if they can consistently be in a good position once you get you know the crossover from qualifying to the race because that's their biggest struggle of course is they'll have a good qualifying but in the race they'll be nowhere and if they can keep testing setups, uh, new specs of car out, and find the right balance of this Haas car and then start to learn from it, then I think they'll really start you know, motoring on for 2020. But I don't really see this team being a big factor at all um, for the rest of this season. I think Haas will finish ninth in the Constructors because I don't think they'll really ever finish in the points. You have to remember... Yes, they finished in the points at Hockenheim, but that was only really because of the wet. If it was dry, they would not have finished in the points at all, even though Roman Corrosion, of course, was P6 in the uh, qualifying session. So, yeah, going forth for Haas, I don't really see anything of note going forward uh, for the final few races. Nib, do you uh, have anything to add to that? Um, Not particularly, yeah, you know. Pass the poor in the race. We've said it a thousand times, and you know if Crojean continues to somehow perform with the uh, Australian spec car, who knows? We we could see Haas move up the uh, well, start to get some better performances in if they fix those issues that they do have with their car, um, with the upgrades not working. Who knows? They could they could all of a sudden see an upturn in performance, but. I doubt it very much, and I think that Haas will probably stay whereabouts they are um, at the moment. Yep, I agree. And now, let's go on to Toro Rosso. Now, of course, after Pierre Gasly was rightfully dropped from Red Bull, Albon goes up, Gasly comes down, and the teammates at Toro Rosso for the final nine races is Gasly and Kvyat. For me, that is what the lineup at Toro Rosso should have been in 2018, because... I think Kvyat did not deserve to get dropped from Toro Rosso for 2018. I think they dropped him because they just didn't want him around anymore. But he uh, matured, of course, Daniel, during 2018. But um, for these final nine races, I think car-wise, again, 
as I said earlier, they're going to drop off. Uh, they're not going to be consistently, you know, there with Renault and Alpha every race. It's going to be tough, tough ask for them to do that. The one thing I'm looking out for is the, the battle between the drivers because it could really decide who gets the Red Bull seat for 2020. Not in terms of Gasly getting it back. Gasly is not getting it back. I don't, I don't think Pierre will ever be back in the Red Bull car because he was so poor in those 12 races that I, I just don't think Red Bull will ever get the bad taste out of their mouth when it comes to that. But if Gasly beats Kvyat in the, in the nine races they are teammates, then that could sway Red Bull to keep Albon in the Red Bull. But if Kvyat destroys Gasly, which I think is more likely, to be honest, because... In a similar way to when Daniel got dropped from Red Bull to Toro Rosso. Even though Carlos Sainz's teammate is of course a very good driver. Daniel is definitely closer to Carlos than he was in the, what was it, the last 16 or 17 races of 2016. The reason he was so far off was because he had no confidence whatsoever and when a driver has no confidence as you've seen with plenty of drivers in the past who have spells where their confidence goes such as Lewis Hamilton in 2011, uh, Daniel Kvyat for example, when they don't have any confidence their performance level drops quite a bit so I think Pierre because his confidence will be on the floor I don't think he is going to bounce back and be the driver he was at Toro Rosso. I, I don't think that will be the case. So I think that's definitely, when it comes to that second Red Bull seat, I think that's the thing to look out for, for sure. Because I think Kvyat will beat Gasly in those final nine races. But if Gasly does bounce back and beat Daniel, then I think that is Daniel's chance at a Red Bull seat for 2020 probably gone. Uh, which would be a shame, but Daniel has to keep up the performance he has had in the first half of the season. He can't just, you know, slack off and stop performing because he thinks his seat at Red Bull is guaranteed. He has to keep on it and beat Gasly for sure in the final nine races. Nib, uh, between Gasly and Kvyat, who do you think will come out on top? And do you think, like me, that it is a very, very important battle? I I absolutely have no idea who's going to win, if I'm perfectly honest. You know, Gasly deprived of confidence, Kvyat off the back of uh, a couple of great results in the Toro Rosso. I think that probably Kvyat will win. And of course, I do agree with you. If Gasly ends up beating Kvyat in the second half of this season at Toro Rosso, then how can they put Kvyat in the car at Red Bull for 2020? I think that's something that a lot of people are missing. So it's absolutely crucial that Kvyat does outperform um, Gasly if he wants to go back in that, if he wants to get his seat back in that Red Bull. Um, so it absolutely is going to be a massive, massive um, thing to watch out for in the second half of the season. That's, of course, if Albon does not perform. Of course, that <laughs> massive, of course, there. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that Toro Rosso will probably fall back a little bit, but who knows? I thought they would fall back a couple of races ago, and then they got a podium. Of course, circumstances uh, allowed for that, but still, I don't think you can really rule out Toro Rosso from getting a great result. They always seem to pick up a point somehow. Um, but yeah, I really think that um, with Gasly, it's an unknown quantity, him going back into that Toro Rosso. Um I, I don't think, you know, he's lost his head quite as much as what Kvyat had when he got dropped from the Red Bull uh, in 2017, I think it was. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that Gasly, Gasly will do okay, but I still think that he'll get beaten by Kvyat, and then that might potentially set up Kvyat for that drive in the Red Bull in uh, 2020. And, of course, it was 2016 that uh, Verstappen went in the in the Red Bull, how could I forget? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, it's definitely something to look out for and something I'll be looking out for uh, in the final nine races, which of course we will cover on the channel. Now, the final midfield team, of course, Racing Point. The first half of the season, uh, really, 
three words describe their season so far and that is lack of development now they do have a lot more new parts on the car so they should be quicker at you know race tracks where they normally are better anyway such as spa monza uh, russia i think they'll be pretty all right uh, mexico of course perez's home grand prix brazil also so i think racing point for sure they're in for a better final half of the season than the first half of the season no doubt about that whether they'll be in the points a lot or on a few occasions i don't know it really comes down to luck driver you know skill and what they do in the race um is the car quick enough it comes down to a few a, a few key factors for racing point i think they will finish in the points at at least three races before the end of the season but it will be tough it's not going to be you know like it was in baku where perez was not comfortably but he was definitely the quickest in that car at baku that weekend it's not going to be like that but if they do get a point it'll be you know two points maybe nick a point but i think racing point the big thing for them is really learning what this car is like in the final nine races because of course they started 2019 in a bad way uh, because their car was not developed enough but if they can learn what this car is like and maybe get ahead a bit earlier for 2020 then maybe that sets them up better for 2020 so it is a very important final nine races for racing point and there are still uh, positions to be made up in the constructors i think at best racing point could finish in probably p6 most likely it will be probably p7 ahead of toro rosso and haas so definitely a lot to play for racing point going into the final nine races and i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they get on with the developments they have at racetracks where they are actually going to be good because let's be honest at the hungarian grand prix even though they did bring some new parts they've never been good at that grand prix nib for racing point uh what do you see for this team for the final nine races well, of course, you say the lack of upgrades, but that is all. That has been Racing Point's philosophy ever since 2015. Now that they, oh, might have been even earlier, but certainly I can certainly remember it uh, prominently from 2015 onwards. They bring that B spec car around uh, Hockenheim or Germany, and of course, it has improved their performance, but not as much as I think that they would like to. Uh, Racing Point will certainly be hoping that in the second half of the season, that they can score some more points. And of course, of course, hopefully during the, uh, the, the mid the, well, the summer break, that Lance Stroll has been doing a little bit of work to maybe perhaps improve his qualifying performance. I know that might be something you might want to look at. I think it's, he's only been out of Q1 once, or into Q2 once so far this season. So, Please, Lance Stroll, improve that. Otherwise, you can be a very good midfield driver. That's uh, that's certainly going to be their main focus. But, of course, Perez, I think he's been quite poor um, most of the, well, the first half of the season. Um, up, you know, in China, he was fifth in the, cha in, the uh, in the actual championship, I think it was. And, oh, no, no, no. Racing Point were fifth in the constructors. I, I must uh, correct myself there. You know, Perez was picking up points, but ever since then, it's been quite disappointing. I think the last time he got a point was in Azerbaijan, so it's been quite a long time. And Racing Point, if they want to do well, need to be scoring points, obviously. But I don't see it happening. I expect them to be towards the back end of the midfield um, for most of the second half of the season. Um, you know, it's very, it's going to be very tough to dislodge, you know, Toro Rosso um, and... And who else? And uh, Alfa Romeo from those positions. They could dislodge um, Renault. Who knows how Renault will do in the second half of the season. 
but certainly uh, Racing Point, I expect them to be in the points a few more times than what they were in the first half of the season. In the second half of the season, and I'd expect them to be getting, um, well, expecting Lance Stroll to perhaps get out of uh, Q1 a few more times. Yeah, hopefully he does, because as you said, if he actually improved his qualifying big time, he could be a, not quality-wise, a Kimi raikkonen like driver, but in terms of results and similarities in terms of qualifying and the race differences, he could be a consistent points finisher, but he cannot get qualifying together, and that's why Lance Stroll has not finished in the points that many times in 2019. Not because his race pace has been poor, it's because his qualifying pace is so bad that he's not good enough to make up that much ground. He's good enough to make up some ground, but not, you know, 10 or more places in every Grand Prix. So hopefully he doesn't prove that. And that is the midfield, of course. At the back is Williams. Uh, Williams have improved their car, but surely this team has to be focusing on 2020 because I don't really see what there is to gain out of the final nine races for 2019. They're not going to catch anyone, of course, in the constructors. Um, their car... Really, they need to be thinking about 2020 of their car because if they can get it a bit more right for 2020, then they might not be a back marker, but they might be on the back of the midfield in a similar way at times to how they were in 2018, which would definitely be better for their drivers, Russell and Kubica. Uh, but Williams don't expect anything going for the final nine races. They're still hot trash. They're, they're a terrible team. Their car is still terrible. Russell is doing so well pace-wise in that car. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the car, the team, they are absolute trash. So don't expect anything really from this team. And that is the preview for the rest of the teams for, but, uh, or for the whole, all the teams for the rest of 2019. And of course, some of the drivers. Now, one final thing I want to do is predict with Nib, and I'll get his predictions in a moment, not exactly who will win every you know, remaining Grand Prix, but which team or driver will pick up you know, so many wins for the rest of the season. So, of course, there's nine races to go. So, I'll do me first. So, Ferrari, I don't think will win a race. I think they'll be on pole a couple of times, but I don't think they'll win. I, I don't think they have the race pace, first off, to win a race. I think for Red Bull, Red Bull will win. I'm going to go for... I'm going to go for three. I think Red Bull will win three more races. All of them will be Max Verstappen. And then the final six races, or the other six races, of course, will be for Mercedes. Uh, I think Hamilton will probably win five of them. And then I'm going Valtteri to nick a final win. I think Valtteri will get another win because I think as long as Valtteri can keep up the qualifying performances, I think one of these races eventually will come right for him and he will be able to get a, a final win of the season. Nib, for you, not a specific races but who is going to take you know how many wins for the rest of the season in your opinion for team and driver yeah i was about to say uh if you're asking me for uh specifics uh good luck on that one there because <laughs> i am <laughs> with predictions it's not exactly my thing i'm not you know i'm not very good at them and uh well how can you predict what's going to happen in abu dhabi when we're sat here in august you know that sort of stuff um but I think Ferrari will win a race. We are that Spa, Monza, or Suzuka. Who knows? Uh, Mercedes. I well, what? There's nine races left, so I need to make sure that I don't uh, <laughs> don't do too many races here. I think Mercedes will probably win five, five or six of the remaining races, and then Red Bull will win a couple there. That that's the best you're going to get out of me for predictions for the second half <laughs> of the season. But ultimately, I think it will be the the Hamilton and Verstappen show. Uh, for the second half of the season, like it has been really um, for the last couple of races. 
Yep, I absolutely agree. I think we'll have, you know, Vettel, Leclerc, Bottas. They'll get in there a couple of times. But I, as you say, I think it will be Hamilton, Verstappen at most races going for the victory. But Nib, uh, thank you for coming along for this podcast episode. Uh, great to have you along again. And uh, yeah, we are not far away from the uh, the racing getting back. We're only a fortnight away. So uh, yeah, can't wait for that. Uh, back to back, Spa and then the Italian Grand Prix, of course, at Monza. Yep, indeed, it is uh, going very, very quickly already, just a fortnight away. And of course, I enjoy coming on the podcast as usual. And thank you once more, everyone who supports us. And I hope you have a very good day. Yep, thanks, Neb, for coming on. I just want to, though, before I get into plugging uh, the other things on my channel, you know, how you can follow me and keep up to date with what content I'm doing, I just want to let you guys know as to the content coming up next week on the channel so the next video won't be coming for quite a bit of time uh, the next video will be i think probably tuesday i might move that to monday if i could fit another video in sometime during the week as an extra video uh but it's probably for now going to be on tuesday and it will be a video to do with fernando alonso there's another video next week, probably around Thursday, coming on Max Verstappen. And then, of course, we will be doing the podcast on Saturday, next Saturday, previewing the 2019 Belgian Grand Prix. Because, of course, a week after that is the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa, Francorchamps. Now, there might be an extra video, again, as I said, for next week. It's either going to be a video... To do with Renault slash Daniel Ricciardo or Carlos Sainz. I'm not sure yet what it will be. Or maybe another idea I have, which is a bit of a wacky idea that I think you guys will like. I'm not sure yet how many videos will come out next week. But for sure, those three I talked about are for sure the videos, at least those videos, will be coming out next week. So don't forget to check those videos out. But guys, that's been it for the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe for more content like this as we do podcast once a week on the channel bottom right of the screen you can do it right there or click on my channel and then go to the home page and subscribe and hit the notifications bell and smash the like button for more content like this and also comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below uh what did you think of our opinion of what we had to say on certain subjects and for the rest of the season who are you looking out for, for the teams and drivers? And what do you think will happen for the rest of 2019 for these teams and drivers? Also, don't forget to join the Discord server. Link below in the description. That's the best place for notifications for my videos and streams. And also, it is the hardcore Chaz HDL4 community. Also, follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110 and check out my website ChazHD.com for more content like this. But guys, until my next video, which is likely to be a video about Fernando Alonso, which I think you guys will like, it has been me, Chaz HD. Goodbye.